Hey everyone, my name is Katie Wiskar from UBC IM POCUS, and today we're going to be talking about basic LV function assessment. So when we're talking about basic cardiac point of care ultrasound, there are really four main areas that we can look at. Left ventricular systolic function assessment, right ventricular size and function, pericardial effusions, and basic valve evaluation. And that would include a 2D evaluation for gross signs of disease and color Doppler for severe regurgitation. So in this screencast today, we're gonna to focus on LV systolic function. Now, before we get started into the actual techniques that we're gonna use, a brief word about the evidence behind this, because this is actually an area of focus where there is pretty solid evidence for this technique. So this first paper was a study showing that emergency medicine physicians with ultrasound training can accurately classify LVEF as normal, depressed, or severely depressed, so in one of those three categories, with an R of 0.86 compared to cardiologist review, so pretty good for that broad categorization. Similarly, in this study, intensivists with minimal training in echocardiography were able to correctly categorize LV function, again as normal, moderately depressed, or severely depressed, 82% of the time compared to formal transthoracic echocardiography. And here, once again, we see a pretty solid performance for basic point of care estimation of LV function. In this study, emergency physicians competent in basic ultrasound who had undergone a three hour training session were able to accurately classify LVEF again as normal, meaning EF of over 55% in this study, moderately depressed, so an EF of 30 to 55%, or severely depressed with an EF of less than 30. And here again, there was an 86% overall agreement with formal echocardiography. And it's worth noting that the most common mistake made in this study was mistaking normal LVEF for moderately decreased or vice versa. And there are actually no instances of emergency physicians missing severe systolic dysfunction. So these studies and others provide pretty strong evidence that basic categorization of LV function is firmly in the wheelhouse of POCUS providers. Finally, this is one last study to highlight this was a study validating the use of EPSS, E-point septal separation, for estimation of LV systolic function, showing good correlation with MRI estimation of LVEF. And we'll talk more about EPSS in a bit. So when we're thinking about categorizing LVEF, the level of granularity will depend on your level of expertise. At a beginner level, really the dichotomy you want to be able to make is, is this EF terrible or is their heart probably not the cause of their shock? And even that very basic dichotomy can be super useful if you have a crashing patient in front of you. As you progress and become proficient in basic cardiac focus, the goal is to be able to categorize LV systolic function into one of four boxes. Hyperdynamic, so an EF of over 70%. Normal, an EF of 50 to 70%. Moderately depressed, an EF of 30 to 50%. Or severely depressed, an EF of less than 30%. And these are essentially the categories used in the studies we've just mentioned, as you'll note. Of course, at the level of comprehensive diagnostic echocardiography, they will estimate EF more precisely, typically using Simpson's biplane method, but this isn't a point of care skill. So when we're looking to qualitatively estimate ejection fraction, there are three things we're going to look at. Myocardial excursion, so are the walls moving? Myocardial thickening, are the walls thickening? and E-point septal separation, which is a semi-quantitative measure that we'll go through. In terms of which views you wanna to get to help you make this estimation, really whatever is available to you. Many people like a peristernal long axis and peristernal short axis views for EF estimation, but really you'll have to use what you have as every patient will be different. Note that you will need a peristernal long axis view to estimate E-point septal separation, as we'll discuss. So of our three markers, the first thing we'll look at is myocardial excursion. So this is an estimation of how much the walls are coming together or squeezing with each contraction. And this is almost always done with an eyeball estimation, and this is proven reliable for broad categorization, as we've seen in these studies. It can be measured using something called fractional shortening, which we'll demonstrate in a minute. Really the key here is the more hearts you will see, the better you will become at this estimation and determining what amount of myocardial excursion or movement is normal. So here we have an example of normal myocardial excursion. The endocardial borders are a little bit dark here, but you can definitely appreciate that the walls appear to be coming together nicely in systole. And you can compare that movement to this clip. Again, the endocardial borders are slightly suboptimal, but you can certainly see that there's barely any movement to the myocardium. There's very little squeeze with each contraction. 
And here we have two clips side by side for comparison. On the left, you can once again see that there's really minimal myocardial excursion, no more than a quiver, compared to normal excursion on the right. So as we noted, it is possible to measure myocardial excursion semi-quantitatively with what is called fractional shortening. And this is usually done in M mode in a parasternal long axis view with the line of interrogation placed in the mid LV cavity. You would then use calipers to measure the difference in LV cavity size in systole versus diastole and calculate the difference. A normal fractional shortening is between 25 and 45% and less than 25% is abnormal. So I mentioned this here for completeness. However, the vast majority of POCUS practitioners don't use this technique and I don't use it myself. I really think it adds very little beyond eyeball estimation and is a potential source of error if you're off axis with your views or imprecise in your measurements. Okay, moving on. So the second of the three things we're gonna look at is myocardial thickening. So is the myocardium actually becoming thicker with each contraction? And again, this can be hard to see if you don't have clearly defined endocardial borders, but in this clip, you can see that the cardiac walls not only move together during systole, but the myocardium itself actually appears to thicken appropriately. You can ignore the color in this clip, but here you can clearly see the difference in that there is essentially no change in the thickness of the myocardium with each contraction. So this would be abnormal. All right, and finally, the third parameter we're gonna talk about to help us categorize LVEF is EPSS, E-point septal separation. Now, diastology is a whole talk for another day, don't worry, uh, but this slide is useful to illustrate the normal mitral inflow pattern as it relates to what we're talking about here. So in early diastole, when the mitral valve initially opens, blood rushes into the left ventricle. There's then a period of diastasis followed by another small opening of the mitral valve due to the atrial kick. So this bottom graph here is what you'd obtain if you use spectral Doppler, pulse wave Doppler, to look at blood inflow into the left ventricle. But what we're interested in when it comes to estimating LVEF is the actual movement of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve that's associated with each of these waves. So to do this, we're essentially going to use a parasternal long axis view to look at how close the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve comes to the interventricular septum during that first opening in early diastole. And it's really important here to have a well aligned parasternal long axis view, particularly if you're going to actually use M mode and not just eyeball this. A heart that's pitched vertically on the screen, as is often the case if you have to move quite low down on the chest to get your view, will throw off the alignment for M mode. So EPSS can be done qualitatively using visual estimation or in a semi-quantitative fashion using M mode and then using calipers to measure the shortest distance between the anterior mitral leaflet and the intraventricular septum. And in terms of our normal values, a normal EPSS is less than 0.7 centimeters or seven millimeters. So that is under normal circumstances, the anterior mitral valve leaflet should come very close to the intraventricular septum, often hitting it. So a low measured value for EPSS corresponds to a higher left ventricular ejection fraction. An EPSS of 0.7 to 1.7 centimeters roughly corresponds to a moderately decreased LVEF, so maybe in that 30 to 50% range. And an EPSS of more than 1.7 centimeters is very abnormal and roughly corresponds to a severely depressed LVEF, so less than 30%. And again, these correlations aren't exact, but they can help you know what ballpark you're probably talking about. So this is just a still image to illustrate the distance that we're looking at. So again, what we want to train our eye to is how close does this anterior mitral valve leaflet get to the intraventricular septum during that first opening in early diastole. So we can eyeball EPSS, and especially if EF is normal and the anterior mitral valve leaflet is clearly hitting the septum, this is really easy to eyeball from a BMO view. And that's usually what I do if it's very clearly normal and I can see the mitral valve hitting the septum as we can here. You can also slow down the clip or freeze and scroll to see it more obviously, and that can be really useful as you're starting out. We can also use M mode to help with this. So the key here is going to be proper placement of your M mode line of interrogation. So you want it to go through the very tip of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. If you are too far into the LV cavity, obviously you will miss the valve leaflet itself. And if you're too proximal on the valve leaflet, you'll underestimate its movement and get a falsely high value for EPSS. So here we can see what the result in M mode tracing would look like. 
So this thick line here would represent the septum, and this thin line here is the movement of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And in most cases, we'll see two distinct peaks. So the E point is gonna be your first opening, and that's the one we're interested in here. And your second peak is gonna be your A point, and that's that second opening representing the atrial kick. Once you've obtained this tracing, what you do is use calipers to measure the distance between the E point and the intraventricular septum. And in cases like this, where the distance is obviously very minimal, it can actually be quite hard to measure. And you can just eyeball this and call this normal. So this is clearly less than 0.7 centimeters. So this slide here is just to illustrate a common variation in this M mode tracing. So you'll note that this tracing only has one peak and that's the E point. So this tracing is missing an A point as the patient is in atrial fibrillation. You may note from the irregular rhythm. So there's no atrial kick to generate an A point. So it's important to mention a few common pitfalls with EPSS measurement as a surrogate of LV function. So there are a few conditions that can give you a falsely high EPSS measurement that could lead you to underestimate LV systolic function. Remember, a higher numerical EPSS measurement corresponds to a lower LVEF. So one of the big things here is valve problems, in particular mitral stenosis, because in this case, the minimal movement of the anterior mitral leaflet isn't due to poor LV function, but rather due to an intrinsic restriction of the valve leaflets. Similarly, moderate or severe aortic regurgitation will also do this, as a strong regurgitant jet will hit the anterior mitral valve leaflet, causing a fluttering and less pronounced opening. Finally, very severely dilated cardiomyopathy can also do this due to a very large LV cavity size, uh, though this is obviously often accompanied by true LV systolic dysfunction. On the flip side, there are also a couple ways that you can get a falsely low EPSS measurement, so causing you to overestimate LV function. View problems are a big one here, so not being on axis or having some cylinder effect present. And then also patients who have focal LV hypertrophy on their septum, which will obviously decrease the distance that the anterior mitral valve leaflet needs to travel. In a more general sense, it's again important to highlight common pitfalls with this eyeball technique for LVEF estimation. So when at all possible, and this holds true for almost all of point of care ultrasound, always obtain more than one view to corroborate your conclusions. It's also really easy to be fooled by heart rate with LVES estimation. So we all have a natural tendency to overestimate LVEF in tachycardic patients and conversely to underestimate it in bradycardic patients. So slowing down or speeding up clips in your archiving system is a great tool to avoid being swayed by heart rate. Obviously, it can be hard to estimate LVEF if you can't see the myocardium well, uh, particularly if you're trying to measure EPSS. Always try to avoid common mistakes like foreshortening, cylinder effect, and off-axis views. And finally, be aware that regional wall motion abnormalities and septal dyskinesia can affect your perception of EF, particularly if you're only using a single view. So wall motion abnormalities are a whole topic unto themselves that we won't get into today. But this is one of the reasons why we always want to look in multiple views to try to get a good sense of the global ejection fraction. Finally, a quick word about hyperdynamic hearts. So we use this term to mean an ejection fraction of over 70%. And visually, this is reflected by the LV walls coming very close to touching during systole. And I think this is easiest assessed in a parasternal short axis view. In a mid pat muscle level view, what we're looking for is to see the pat muscles touching during systole. Once again, don't be fooled by tachycardia and the temptation to label all tachycardic patients as hyperdynamic. So this is an example clip from the POCUS Atlas, a fantastic resource for free open access POCUS images and resources that demonstrates a hyperdynamic heart in a short axis view. And you can see those pat muscles touching. This is a parasternal long axis view. And obviously this view is a bit suboptimal as there's definitely some foreshortening and maybe some cylinder effect going on caused in part by the excessive movement of the heart itself. But you can appreciate hopefully that the LV walls are very close to touching during systole. All right, so to finish off, we'll just go through a few example slides for practice. And again, the best way to learn this technique is just to look at a lot of hearts. So comparing your own POCUS images to comprehensive echo images and then reading the echo report is a great idea to learn this. And there are some great sites online, uh, including our own UBCIM POCUS site, as well as the POCUS Atlas and others that have image galleries that can help you test your interpretation skills. So here we can see really minimal myocardial excursion and thickening with this heart. 
We can't comment on EPSS as we're not in a peristernal long axis view, but we can pretty confidently say that this EF is severely depressed, so less than 30%. In this next heart, we see the myocardial excursion and thickening are a bit improved. However, the anterior mitral leaflet is quite a long way visually from the septum. And I think in fact, there's some fluttering of that anterior leaflet to suggest some aortic regurgitation, though we can't comment on that because of a lack of color. Uh, but in any event, I would put this in the moderately depressed LVEF category. In this heart, the endocardial borders are a bit tough to see, making this slightly trickier. But hopefully you can appreciate that there's good myocardial excursion and some thickening there with each contraction. So this EF is normal. Here it's pretty obvious once again that we have very poor systolic function, as there's hardly any myocardial excursion in most areas and very little thickening. And there's likely some regionality here, but overall this EF is definitely less than 30%. Finally, here we have a nice parasternal long axis view demonstrating good myocardial excursion and thickening and visually a very low EPSS. Note that the anterior mitral valve leaflet pretty much touches the septum. Now don't be fooled by what is likely a premature beat at the end of the clip. Uh, this EF is normal. All right, that's everything for today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope this was useful. Visit us at ubcimpocus.com for more POCUS resources and be sure to follow us on Twitter. Happy scanning.